Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you this morning. My name is Phil, and uh, we're here from the, the youth room this morning. And uh, just before we begin, it's, uh, I'm amazed how many people are involved in putting this together. And a special shout out to everyone who's had a hand in, in this morning's service. A special shout out to Jenny and Craig, who've helped me put this together. Okay, um, as we begin, let's, uh, let's pause and pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we thank you that you are here this morning with us. We have one simple request this morning. We, we ask that you open our, our eyes, open our ears, that we can hear from you. That's our desire. We want to hear from you, God, and we want to then respond to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. This morning, I've uh, entitled our time, uh, Challenging Truth, Operating in the Midst of Our Unmodern Families. A challenging truth operating in our families. And, and a little challenge as we start off this morning. See if you can pick up what this challenging truth is as we walk through what we're going to walk through this morning. We're going to be spending some time in the Old Testament part of the Bible, and we're going to be spending some time in the New Testament part of the Bible as we work our way through this morning. So first up is the Old Testament, and uh, <coughs> this part is taken from six books in the Old Testament. Um, Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1st and 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Six books that span 430 years, and I'm going to put it to you this way, of family history. 430 years of family history. The main characters this morning are God, of course, but also kings and one queen. I've listed the kings and one queen here on this side of uh, where we are this morning. And one of the interesting things is we, um, I've read this, these books several times in chronological order. And it was in doing that that this challenging truth kind of jumped off the page. So we're going to walk through that this morning. God watched these kings and one queen their day-to-day -day life, their family life, and he had an interesting way of summarizing them with two words. Either it was they did right in God's eyes or they did evil in God's eyes. Some of them did right and did evil, and we're going to show you that this morning. So on the wall behind me, I've got the key characters. And we're going to start off this morning with David. He is the most well-known king of the Bible. And uh, God summarized his life with a pink square. That's what's going to represent did right. So David, throughout his lifetime, God said, this was a righteous man in my eyes. He did right. David had a son named Solomon. Now, every person here in this family tree is related to the next person above them. They're not distant relatives. They are family members, okay? So David has a son. His name is Solomon, another guy that we know really well, right? He's a wise guy. He's full of wisdom. He did right initially and then did evil towards the latter part of his life. So we represented that with a half pink, a half purple square. So we've got did right, did right, did evil. Solomon has a son. This is where, you, if you're home, you can have some fun with this, saying some of these names. Rehoboam. Rehoboam. Say it quickly. He was the son of Solomon. He followed in his, foot, his father's footsteps and was known by adding a lot of taxes to the people. It was during his reign as king that the, the, the unified kingdom of, of Israel split into two. The northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah. 
The rest of these people are in the line of Judah. So we're going to follow the family tree through Judah. You're getting the idea. Rehoboam was summarized by God as he did evil in God's sight. He has a son, Abijam. He gets a purple square, did evil. Oh, Abijam's family life, full of evil. He has a son named Asa, who did right in the eyes of the Lord. Interesting. Asa has a son, Jehoshaphat. He too did right in the eyes of the Lord. Jehoshaphat has a son named oh, Jehoram. God said he did evil. Jehoram has a son, Ahaziah. He also follows in his footsteps and did evil. We move up to Athaliah. This is the queen in the mix. Athaliah is his mother. And this lady, if you look at her story, she is pure evil. Selfishly pure evil. She murders so many people. She gets a purple square, did evil. Joash comes next. He's a half and half kind of guy. Starts out well, does evil as he ages. Doesn't end so well. Amaziah is his son. Did well, did evil. Uzziah comes out of that. God says this man did, did right. He was a righteous man. Jotham is his son. He does right. And then, oh my goodness, out of this righteous family comes one of the worst kings that we know, King Ahaz. Ahaz, evil. Out of that family where he modeled, he influenced pure evil, comes Hezekiah. God says he was one of the most righteous kings in that history. Whoa, then from this righteous family where everything is doing right in God's eyes comes one of the worst kings, Manasseh. Manasseh has a son. Ammon does evil. From that family comes Josiah. Did right in God's eyes. From this righteous family comes Jehoahaz, does evil. Jehoiakim does evil. Jehoiachin does evil. Zedekiah does evil. You see a challenging truth in this family history? 430 years of family history? After this, the Babylonian Empire moves in, takes over, these folks are deported. Jerusalem is sacked. The temple is destroyed. And the kingdom of Judah ends. Have you seen what the challenging truth in this little overview of 430 years might be? All right. You've got your Bibles in front of you. Whatever way you have your Bible, Turn in the Bible with me to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look at this passage, and we're going to poke our way through it. It uh, is one of the many parables that Jesus taught during his time on earth. And I just want to remind us as we start what a parable is. A parable is something from real life, so the real life of Jesus and the people back then, that he used to teach spiritual truth. Something from real life he uses to, to teach spiritual truth. Okay, let's, uh, Matthew 13, if you're there, follow along. We're going to poke our way through. So verse 1. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Here's the lake. It is the Lake of Galilee. Most of the ministry of Jesus was around the Lake of Galilee. Verse 2, Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Jesus, the crowds, outdoors by the Lake of Galilee, 
Can you picture it? He's in a fishing boat for his, his podium, his pulpit, as it were. I think I can smell some fishiness coming from the nets. Probably a few seagulls hanging around looking for a snack. Waves lapping on the shore. Not your typical teaching setting, hey? Kind of reminds me of uh, Pastor Craig in the raspberry bushes. It kind of reminds me of Pastor Rob on the farm. Here's Jesus by his favorite lake, Lake of Galilee. What's he going to use from his real life to teach us this morning? Well, it happens to be in verse 3. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. That's who he's going to use to teach this morning. Verse 4. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it. So we've got a farmer sowing his seed, right? Agriculture 2,000 years ago. Spread some seed, kick some dirt over it so the seed is buried. But some of the seed fell on these footpaths. Let's understand a little bit about these footpaths. There were no highways. There were no vehicles. People would walk from village to village. Not only they would walk, but their animals would walk. These paths is how they got between these places. The middle of a farmer's field would be a path. So some of the seed that he threw out there would fall on these hard, hard packed paths. Birds would often hang around because they knew the seeds wouldn't go into this dirt. Easy meal for the birds. What, what might Jesus be interested in this? Let's carry on. Verse 5. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. Verse 6. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Those of you who have been to Israel know that there's lots of rocks and lots of hot sun if you go in the right time of the year. Often in farmer's fields, there was a thin layer of soil. They didn't know what was under their soil. And the only way they could tell was when they started planting their seeds. The seeds would germinate, they would come up, and then they would be exposed to this hot, scorching sun. If they didn't have any roots because it hit rock, they would wither away. That's how a farmer knew that he had rock underneath that thin layer of dirt. Interesting. Let's move on. Verse 7. Oh, other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Um, we, we had the privilege of seeing some of these weeds when we were over in Israel, and these weeds are tough. They're pokey, like when you put them under a microscope. Farmers did their best to get rid of these babies once when they, were, when they were growing, but there was always weed seed hanging around. So when the weed seed and the wheat seed were planted together, they would grow up together. These babies would take over and choke out the wheat, and there would be nothing, nothing there to grow. Ooh, I wonder what Jesus is going to say about that. Let's move on. Still other seed fell among the good soil where it produced a crop. Yay! A hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. The wheat growing process was well understood by those people who sat or stood by the lake shore listening to Jesus. But what did this all mean in the spiritual world? Jesus in... Uh, um, issues an interesting invitation in verse 9. Whoever has ears, like they all had ears, right? They were standing there listening to him. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Jesus was saying to them, do you really want to know what these words mean? Do you really want to understand what this common story that you know 
really means. At this point, uh, one of the other books in, in, uh, in the early part of the New Testament says many of the people that were standing there actually left Jesus after he issues this invitation. They actually weren't really interested in hearing what this was about as far as the spiritual world goes. Drop down to verse 18 with me, and we're going to find out what it means, because this is one of the parables that Jesus explains in detail. Verse 18, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. Verse 19, when anyone, so this starts to become about people, anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown into their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So let's pick up Jesus' comparisons here. He compares his message, the words of the kingdom, to the seed. He, there's a farmer in his story. He is the farmer. Jesus is the, sto- is the farmer sharing the words of God with people. The path is a person. A person who hears the message but chooses not to let it into their hardened life. Notice the birds. Jesus compares them to the evil one. Always ready, hanging around Satan, our spiritual enemy, wanting to take the words of God out of our life. Jesus, spreading the words of God, his words are falling onto a person who chooses not to let God in, a hardened individual. All right, let's go on to the next person that Jesus talks about. Verse 20, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word, yes, and at once receives it with joy. Yeah. Verse 21, but since they have no root, They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. There's some hearing and there's some joy. But under that, there is a different kind of hardness again. Rock. Those of you who are farmers in the crowd know that stuff does not grow in rock. When stuff hits rock, it it withers, Jesus said. Jesus compares the hot sun to persecution because of the words of the kingdom in our life. The word that's used here is the word for suffering, which comes from the outside. Persecution for one's beliefs. When this happens, this kind of persecution, this person falls away. Experience that in your life? Do you know anyone who, who's like that? We're starting to catch on to this parable a little bit, right? Two types of soil, two types of people. This parable is about people. People like you, like me, like in our families, like in our family trees. You see in a challenging truth here? What about the thorns? Pick it up in verse 22. The seed fell among the thorns, which refers to someone who hears the word, but, I love that word, but. Jesus uses it, and it's like the story turns a sharp corner. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Worry. Let's pause there. How about this for a definition? When I choose to dwell on real or imagined problems. Dwelling on real or imagined problems. It's called worry. Worry has the effect of choking out God's word in my life. God's words in my life. God in my life. He moves on. Jesus says, deceptiveness of wealth. Have you ever thought wealth is deceptive? What's going on here? Let me, let me 
give you a couple of lies that wealth can tell us. How about this one? My wealth means that I'm successful. It shows that I'm successful. How about this one? My wealth gives me security. Or my wealth gives me meaning and purpose. Can you detect the lies in these sentences about wealth? In God's eyes, in Jesus' kingdom, am I really successful? Am I secure? Am I full of meaning and purpose when I focus my life on wealth building? The deceitfulness of wealth. Jesus says, when these things are my focus, the kingdom of God, his word, him gets choked out. There's no fruitfulness going on. Finally, we come to the last soil. Verse 23, but the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone, this is about people, right, who hears the word of God and understands it. Hearing and understanding, this is the one who produces a crop yielding 160, 30 times what was sown. There's a little nugget here that we need to understand, and it is the meaning of the word understand. Okay? In Jesus' day, the word understand meant this, that you as a person were good at practicing what you knew to be true. Practicing what you knew to be true meant you understood something in Jesus' day. Compare it to that word today. I find myself thinking about understanding as this, more about head knowledge. So I hear a good sermon that I understand. I hear a good podcast that I understand. I read a good book that I understand. I'm kind of understanding what that person is trying to lay down. But it's not so much about the putting into practice of the truth that is in focus. This was not so in Jesus' day. That is why, in fact, Jesus often talked about people who heard the words of God, but they're not really hearing because they're not interested in walking it out. Jesus gives us a bit of a math equation here. Hearing plus his definition of understanding, walking the truth out, equals fruitfulness. That's what's going on here in the last type of soil that he's looking at, the last type of person he's looking at. All right. We've looked at the Old Testament. We've looked at the New Testament. What is the challenging truth operating in our families today? So let's, let's recap the Old Testament part, right? We see a person, let's say Asa, he's doing right in his family, his son, his family follows and does right. We get that. We see a guy like Rehoboam who's doing evil, God says. He has a son that's Abijam that does evil. Well, it, it kind of follows our thinking, right? We kind of expect that. But, to steal a word from Jesus, but what about these situations where, like Jehoshaphat, God considers him righteous, but his son does evil. We're not expecting that too much, are we? Or what about a purple to pink situation? Ahaz, one of the evil, evil kings, his, his family, his influence. Out of that comes Hezekiah, this righteous, righteous king. I find that challenging. What's going on here? We don't expect it. What about these situations as well? Amaziah, half, his life is half devoted to right and half to evil. And out of that comes this righteous person. Now, what is not shown here in this 430 years is someone who may start out evil, but God says his life. You know, like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Then we go back to our parable. We've got Jesus. 
God in the flesh, the most compelling teacher and preacher. Right? He tells us that when his words are shared, people are going to receive them in different ways. Hardness, rockiness, a heart occupied by worry and wealth building. And then the person who fully receives his words and lives them out. You know, working in the uh, field of social work for the last uh, quarter of a century, I've seen this challenging truth play out time and time and time again. I was chatting with someone recently who recounted the lives in their family tree that they were a part of. The parents, this was not 430 years, this was maybe 50, 60 years. The parents are godly, godly individuals. We would call them pink square people today, right? That's what God would say. These folks have done right all their life. Yet, in this person's family tree, there are sons and daughters and grandchildren. They're not so much pink square type people. Some have gotten pregnant in their teens. Some have committed serious crimes and gone to jail. Some left their marriage partners. Some are currently in same-sex relationships. Some are into the drug scene, all from the same family tree. What's going on? Maybe this morning it's, it's your situation. You have followed God all your life. And if, if you were to die today, God would give you a pink square. He would say, this person, you have lived a righteous life. However you find yourself with some children, some grandchildren, some relatives in your family tree, despite all your best modeling, kids have nothing to do with God. We personalize this, don't we? We wonder, what did I do wrong? What didn't I do? How come this kind of spiritual outcome is happening? Often many tears are shed. And it's very, very difficult. What I like about the Bible is it gives us true knowledge about ourselves, about those in our families, those around us. But that true knowledge, that truth can sometimes be challenging. I'm going to put to you today, maybe you've guessed it all along, the challenging truth operating in our families is one simple word, and that's the word choice. The challenging truth operating in our families is choice. And I'm going to close today by just sharing three guarantees that come out of this truth of choice. Firstly, choice is a universal ability that every human being has. Not only that, it's been given by God. That alone is challenging. It's, it's another sermon. We saw choice operating in the royalty family of the Old Testament. We saw choice operating in the parable, how people chose to receive Jesus' words. Each person chooses for themselves how they're going to receive God and His Word. The family we grow up in definitely influences this. But here's guarantee number one I want to put before you. Growing up in a certain family does not guarantee a certain spiritual outcome, either positive or negative. Growing up in a certain family does not guarantee a certain spiritual outcome. Number two, a special word to parents listening this morning who've got children who've walked away from God, Maybe they started out well, haven't ended so well. Maybe some of your kids haven't even let God in one bit, that hardened path. Or perhaps you're in a situation 
or your child has passed away and you did not know what they chose as far as God goes, or you did know what they chose. This is very challenging. It's hard. It's sad. It's painful. It's filled with a lot of grief. But in the midst of that, God knows this and understands it really well. He's with us here collecting our tears. He knows our pain. He is not tired of hearing about our sadness. He is not tired of hearing us pray. God says many times he's close to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. What's guarantee number two? It's this. God is with us in the challenging truth of choice as it plays out in our families. Thirdly, throughout the Bible record, God sees all the choices that people are making. That's why he understands this so well. That's why he understands this truth of choice so well. He's clearly stated, he's clearly demonstrated that he wants everyone to choose him and he gives people opportunities. He doesn't want them to go into eternity choosing to be separated from him. Guarantee number three. God's pursuit and unfailing love continues to give every person opportunity to turn. Turn from their false gods. Turn from their evil ways. And follow him, the true God. Let me close with a couple of words here, a few words. Maybe you're listening this morning, and you know, you've, you've been coming to Westwood for a while. You've been hearing God. He's been softening your ground, your life. And you know, God is saying to you this morning, it's time. It's time to start a relationship with me. To accept the work of Jesus on the cross for the forgiveness of your sin. Right? To accept him as your true king, your true leader. And follow him. Join with a bunch of others in following him. The Bible says God is an expert at softening hearts. He's in the replacement business he takes a rocky heart and gives, gives you a heart that wants to follow God. He knows about worry, he knows about wealth, and he knows exactly how to deal with those two things. Choke out the word. Today's the day to choose him. Find someone, if you need some help, to lead you in that choice to follow him, but make that choice today. Maybe you're a young person here, a teenager, maybe a young adult, maybe even an older person. And you know what? You're at the crossroads. You're on that hard path where God and Satan are working in your life. You know what it is for Satan to come in and take God's words away and start leading you away from God. That's what Satan wants to do. God, on the other hand, wants you to follow him. He wants to lead you into your best fruitful life now and forever. Can we encourage you? Choose to push Satan away out of your life. Choose more and more to follow, follow God at these crossroads in your life. Special word to, to parents of young children this morning. You're following God. You're doing your best. You are pink square people right now. Your kids are tracking well. Let, let us encourage you this morning. Continue to be those pink square type people. Continue setting a godly pace. While there is no guarantees, you will be influencing them in a positive direction. Godly parents of older children here, continue being pink square people. This stuff can be very discouraging when we see this stuff operating. It can drag us away. Encouragement to come back, continue to be pink square people. You know, folks, when all is said and done, this choice of who we're going to follow in life is the most important choice 
we, lay, we, we make in life. Amen? Amen. We're going we're gonna to move into a collective time of prayer this morning. A little bit different in this COVID time that we're in, but nevertheless, we are going to pray. There's a famous historical character named Cory Ten Boom. She talks about prayer. You know, with this challenging truth, sometimes you feel like you're, you're helpless in doing anything, right, to affect the lives of folks in your family tree. Corey says, leaving a world of not being able to do something and entering God's world where everything is possible. He specializes in the impossible, the softening of all those grounds, the taking out of the weeds. Nothing is too great for him and his love. So with that, we're going we're gonna to spend some time praying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you right where you're at in your living rooms, silently. We're going to pray four different ways this morning. I'm going to introduce the first one. We'll pause. There'll be a, some music playing in the background. We'll move to the second one and we'll, we'll work our way through and have a collective prayer meeting in this time. So number one, pray for one person that you know that is pursuing God hotly. They are red hot, no, pink hot type people. Okay, pray that they will continue and not become these kind of half and half, half people. All right, let's pause. One person like that, pray for them right now. Number two, pray for one person that you know who is not following God this morning, who's chosen one of those responses that, that is not fruitful in the kingdom of God. Pray for that one person this morning. Number three, pray for one set of parents or a parent who finds themselves with, with wayward kids, wayward people in their family tree. Pray that they as parents will continue to be pink square type people in spite of what's going on to pursue God hotly. That one set of parents or that one parent, pray for them right now. And finally, number four, pray for one parent or a set of parents whose kids are following God at this time. Pray for the parents. Pray that they will continue to set the pace in their family, continue to be those pink square type of people in spite of what their kids are choosing, even though they're choosing well right now. Pray for that parent or that set of parents. Lord God, you've heard our prayers this morning. We thank you and praise you that you are a prayer listening, prayer hearing God. Thank you that you find our prayers valuable. Thank you that we can enter into your world where nothing is impossible. It's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. One, one last little thing, free for nothing this morning. You know, it's summertime, and uh, sometimes during the summer we find ourselves with a little more time to read. This is a book I've recently read. 
Finding Home, it is the president of Focus on the Family, Jim Daly. It's his autobiography, a wonderful story about all that we've chatted about this morning. If you want to read that book, I've got it right here. I'm uh, willing to lend it out and we can get this going. Go ahead and buy it as well. It's a wonderful read. Okay, it's been great to be with you this morning. Have a fabulous start to the week. Amen.